Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making the start on my review of The Golden Apples of the Sun by Ray Bradbury. So this is a short story collection, it actually has 22 short stories in it, including The Golden Apples of the Sun, which is the title story. I'm going to read you the blurb quickly, then we're going to go through and check out some of my tabs. I'm going to update you as I go, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, The Golden Apples of the Sun. A man suffers blind panic when he journeys into the past to shoot a Tyrannosaurus Rex. A girl looking for love floats in and out of other bodies on a sultry spring night. Women wait anxiously to join their husbands on Mars. A man who can't stand noise any longer becomes a murderer of the strangest kind. A captain makes a terrifying yet electrifying journey to the sun. The Golden Apples of the Sun is a collection of scintillating short stories in which people face traumatic, strange and fantastic happenings. So I like these, this little bit here. Um, basically this guy goes for a walk and the concept's kind of alien and it gets in, in, him in trouble with the police. Uh, so we get this, this whole scene, I think there's some great stuff in it. He turned back on a side street, circling around towards his home. He was, with, with, he was within a block of his destination when the lone car turned a corner quite suddenly and flashed a fierce white cone of light upon him. He stood entranced, not unlike a night moth, stunned by the illumination, and then drawn toward it. A metallic voice called to him, Stand still, stay where you are, don't move. He halted. Put up your hands. But, he said, your hands up, or we'll shoot. The police, of course, but what a rare, incredible thing. In a city of three million, there was only one police car left, wasn't that correct? Ever since a year ago, 2052, the election year, the force had been cut down from three cars to one. Crime was ebbing, there was no need now for the police, save for this one lone car wandering and wandering through the empty streets. Your name? said the police car in a metallic whisper. He couldn't see the men in it for the bright light in his eyes. Leonard Mead, he said. Speak up. Leonard Mead. Business or profession? I guess you'd call me a writer. No profession, said the police car, as if talking to itself. And then in Invisible Boy, we get spunks as a word. And I only ever heard the word spunk to mean one thing. Uh, Charlie, I only want someone to night prattle to, someone to warm hands with at the fire, someone to fetch kindling for my mornings. Someone to fetch kindling for me mornings and fight off the spunks that come creeping fo out. And fight off the spunks that come creeping of early fogs. I ain't got no fetchings on you for myself, son, just for your company. I don't, I, don't need, I don't even know. I don't want to know. So we're here, here we get a character called the Murderer and he like kills machines. Um, so he says, the psychiatrist said, shall we start? Fine. The first victim, or one of the first, was my telephone. Murder most foul. I shoved it in the kitchen incinerator. Stopped the disposal unit in mid-swallow. Poor thing strangled to death. After that, I shot the television set. The, psychi the psychiatrist said, hmm. Fired six shots right through the cathode, made a beautiful tinkling crash, like a drop chandelier. Nice imagery. Thanks, I always dreamt of being a writer. And then I thought this was interesting because he goes on to uh, answer uh, when he first began to hate the telephone, and I don't like telephones. I like smartphones, I don't like telephone calls is the issue. So we've got, it frightened me as a child. Uncle of mine called it the ghost machine, voices without bodies, scared the living hell out of me. Later in life, I was never comfortable. Seemed to me a phone was an impersonal instrument. If it felt like it, it let your personality go through its wires. If it didn't want to, it just drained your personality away until what slipped through at the other end was some cold fish of a voice or steel, copper, plastic, no warmth, no reality. It's easy to say the wrong thing on telephones. The telephone changes your meaning on you. First thing you know, you've made an enemy. Then of course, the telephone's such a convenient thing. It just sits there and demands you call someone who doesn't want to be called. Friends were always calling, calling me. Hell, I hadn't any time of my own. When it wasn't the telephone, it was the television, the radio, the phonograph. When it wasn't the television or radio or the phonograph, it was motion pictures at the corner theatre. Motion pictures projected with commercials on low-lying cumulus clouds. It doesn't rain anymore. It rains soap suds. When it wasn't high-fly cloud advertisements, it was music by Mozek in every restaurant. Music and commercials on the buses I rode to work. When it wasn't music, it was inter-office communications and my horror chamber of a radio wristwatch on which my friends and my wife phoned every five minutes. What is there about such conveniences that makes them so temptingly convenient? The average man thinks, here I am, time on my hands, and there on my wrist is a wrist telephone, so why not just buzz old Joe up, eh? Hello? Hello? I love my friends, my wife, humanity, very much, but when one minute my wife calls to say, where are you now, dear, and a friend calls and says, got the best off-color joke to tell you, seems there was a guy and a stranger calls and cries out, this is the fine facts poll. What gum are you chewing at this very instant? Well, so this is just a quote from the story Embroidery, and I just thought it was a good quote. Uh, I believe, 
said the first lady, that our souls are in our hands. For we do everything to the world with our hands. Sometimes I think we don't use our hands half enough. It's certain we don't use our heads. Then we have a sound of thought, thunder, where people are paying to go into the past to shoot animals. I mean, it does... I hate hunting, obviously, but um, it has some interesting, like, cause and effect stuff, the way they get around it. Like, they find dinosaurs that were going to die anyway, and they make sure they take the bullets and all of this stuff to try and it stop, to make sure they don't interfere with time. Uh, and then in this story, in Powerhouse, there's a character who <laughs> doesn't like going to church, and I just kind of thought it was, uh, yeah. Um, never ever would she have need of a church. She had heard fine people talk on and on of religion and wax pews and calla lilies and great bronze buckets and vast bells of churches in which the preacher rang like a clapper. She had heard the shouting kind and the fervent whispery kind and they were all the same. Hers was simply not a pew shaped spine. And I just think that pew shaped spine line is fantastic. And then we have a story um, about a man who kind of takes offence because there's a like well-known photographer and is basically trying to use like the poor part of town to photograph celebrities because it looks cool. And uh, here we go. There is a photographer two blocks over, said Ricardo, pacing him. They have cutouts. You stand in front of them. It says Grand Hotel. They take a picture of you and it looks like you're in the Grand Hotel. Do you see what I mean? My alley is my alley. My life is my life. My son is my son. My son is not cardboard. I saw you putting my son against the wall, so, and thus, in the background. What do you call it, for the correct air? To make the whole attractive, and the lovely lady in front of him? We are poor people, our doors peel paint, our walls are chipped and cracked, our gutters fume in the street, the alleys are all cobbles. But it fills me with a terrible rage when I see you make over these things, as if I had planned it this way, as if I had years ago induced the wall to crack. Did you think I knew you were coming and aged the paint? Or that I knew you were coming and put my boy in his dirtiest clothes? We are not a studio. We are people and must be given attention as people. Have I made that clear? And then later on he says, Is my face smeared with enough perspiration? Is my hair long enough, kind sir? And I just thought this was a really well written paragraph, so I wanted to share that. Um, it took all of four seconds for the huge hand to push the empty cup to the fire. So here we are again today on another trail, he thought, reaching for a cup of precious gas and vacuum, a handful of different fire with which to run back up cold space, lighting our way, and take to earth a gift of fire that might burn forever. Why? He knew the answer before the question. Because the atoms we work with our hands on Earth are pitiful. The atomic bomb is pitiful and small and our knowledge is pitiful and small. And only the sun really knows what we want to know. And only the sun has the secret. And besides, it's fun. It's a chance. It's a great thing coming here, playing tag, hitting and running. There is no reason, really, except the pride and vanity of little insect men hoping to sting the lion and escape the moor. My God will say, we did it! And here is our cup of energy, fire, vibration, call it what you will, that may well power our cities and sail our ships and light our libraries and tan our children and bake our daily breads and simmer the knowledge of our universe for us for a thousand years until it is well done. Here from this cup, all good men of science and religion, drink. Warm yourselves against the night of ignorance, the long snows of superstition, the cold winds of disbelief, and from the great fear of darkness in each man. So we stretch out our hand with the beggar's cup. So yeah, all in all, my thoughts on this, I mean, like most short story collections, I think there are some stories that are better than others. I actually think that over half of the ones in this I didn't particularly enjoy, but then the ones that I did enjoy, I enjoyed so much that it more than made up for it. Overall, I can't really give it anything other than like a 3.5 out of 5, a middle of the road one, but I would recommend it if you're into Bradbury. And actually this edition of it is a really cool edition as well. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Golden Apples of the Sun by Ray Bradbury. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye